as the title tells, uh, this will be about shadows. And so this work is about actually practical applications of shadows and how we can exploit this rich information that the randomized measurements give us. And of course, this is a uh, joint work with the group of Professor Simon Benjamin, and some of us are actually here at the conference. Um, so first of all, I'd like to give a brief introduction about what, uh, you know, what standard algorithms there are for this specific problem of, of um, extracting eigenvalues of a Hamiltonian. Uh, obviously, phase estimation, probably you, you know about that. And then I will give you some details about uh, shadow spectroscopy, what we are actually doing there, how we are using the rich information uh, ex extracted from these randomized measurements. And finally, I will show you some actual applications that, for example, chemists or physicists can, can benefit from, from, from these techniques. And first of all, I'm just starting here with this uh, really famous quote from Feynman. Probably all of you know this. Uh, but basically, um, what he said is that if we want to simulate uh, quantum mechanical systems, we have to give up using classical systems. We actually need to use quantum mechanical systems to uh, simulate quantum mechanics. As this, uh, and I'm actually just showing you this because it highlights how difficult it is to simulate the time evolution of, of some quantum system. And of course, I'm putting you here the definition of quantum supremacy, which just says that um, it's a threshold where, we, uh, where quantum computers significantly outperform classical ones. But here in this talk, I will specifically focus on, on tasks where we are outperforming classical computers on practical tasks, such as extracting eigenvalues of a Hamiltonian. And that's actually much harder. And actually, the reason why it's, it's um, so hard in practice is that Obviously, due to Feynman, we can use quantum systems to, sim to simulate other quantum systems. But that's not the end of the story. Because think about it, if you time evolve a quantum state, you are given a, a very exotic quantum object. It's really hard to extract useful information out of that quantum state. Obviously, we can do measurements on this. But if we want to extract uh, information like gaps of, of uh, Hamiltonians, then it becomes really, really difficult. And that's why when um, shadow spectroscopy or actually randomized shadow measurements come into play, because they, they have to extract a lot of information about the quantum system. And first of all, you probably know this, there are standard algorithms for, for doing this task, whereby we are given a problem Hamiltonian, and we want to extract eigen energies of that Hamiltonian. And on the right hand side, we have uh, the standard plain simple uh, quantum uh, phase estimation algorithm, which what basically it does, uh, it creates a coherent superposition of, of time evolved quantum states at different time steps. But the important bit is that we have to have a coherent superposition of many time evolved states. And then if we apply a quantum Fourier transform on that, and then we perform a measurement, then basically in a single shot, we can determine uh, what is the energy of the corresponding state and we can even project onto that state precisely. So there was a really great question, I think, from, from over there at the end of uh, Richard Kung's uh, talk, and it was about how can we use shadows in, in algorithms like this one, these fully fault tolerant uh, applications. And it turns out shadows are not really useful here because uh, the reason is that these are super cleverly constructed uh, algorithms that just in a single shot give you the answer. Uh, but of course, there are some drawbacks, in particular, that we need a lot of qubits to do this. We need very low error rates, so we definitely need error correction to implement these kinds of um, algorithms. But of course, there, there has been work on, on making this cheaper and actually making this NISC compatible. And uh, of course, there has been a lot of works on this. The latest one is this, which was actually a talk last year uh, at this conference. And the idea there is that we just take a single unitary evolution and get rid of the ancilla register. We just have a single ancilla qubit and measure that out constantly at different uh, time steps. And then we classically post-process uh, uh, the information. Uh, on the other end of this spectrum of, of uh, circuit depth, we have uh, these very famous, uh, very popular variational quantum eigen solvers whereby we, we have very shallow depth circuits so that they are compatible with um, near-term quantum devices. And the idea there is that basically we can efficiently extract energy information from a quantum state. That's the expected value of the Hamiltonian. Uh, and then we 
we keep updating the, the parameters of the circuit so that we minimize the energy. And once we find the minimum of the energy, then we are sure that we, we can actually never be sure, uh, but we think we are in a ground state and then we assume that that's the ground state uh, we have found. But there are huge drawbacks of this uh, paradigm. In, in fact, to, to get a precise estimate of this, of this energy, we need lots of repetitions of the circuit. Uh, precisely because it's hard to extract uh, information under shot noise. Uh, but of course we need to have a sufficient depth so that we have a chance of approximating the ground state. And uh, that's highly non-trivial in, in these devices. And even if we can do that, uh, then still we need to have a really good idea where to start the optimization procedure. Because if we don't have a good initial state, then we might end up in local traps or uh, barren plateaus and so on. But in, in shadow spectroscopy, in this work, we don't do any of this, actually. So we completely give up uh, preparing eigenstates. So in the previous slides, I was talking about techniques that first prepare the eigenstate and kind of then determine the energy of it to uh, extract estimates of the gaps. But here, we don't even do that at all. We just have a uh, rough uh, initial state that has some overlap with the ground state. And then we just time evolve that. Uh, we need nothing else, just time evolution plus measurements, actually standard classical shadow measurements. And this comes with re really significant uh, uh, benefits. For example, we only need like 10 or 200 shots per time step to, to get very precise uh, gap estimates. And that's in stark contrast to VQE, where we need like 10 to the 6 or even beyond. And uh, one nice thing that I will show you that, as opposed to VQE and NISC uh, algorithms, we are kind of immune to gate noise because the information is no longer encoded into um, an energy measurement or something like that, but rather the information is encoded into frequencies that we can classically extract. And let's just get down to the technical details. Um, so the really nice thing about this approach is that uh, it only relies on measurements, kind of trivial measurements, and the time evolution. The time evolution is not trivial, but the community has worked really hard in, over the last decades to uh, develop a broad range of different simulation algorithms, which range from cheap NISC variational algorithms that are uh, easily implementable, but it come, they come at, at a cost uh, that they will have some algorithmic errors in them. And of course, there are really sophisticated techniques uh, that are almost exact. And uh, unfortunately, they require really uh, sophisticated quantum computers with fault tolerance. Uh, but ultimately, the task is to approximate this kind of evolution under the Hamiltonian. And if we do that, then you might recall from standard phase estimation that the core idea is that we, when we time evolve that quantum state, we kind of have uh, this decomposition of the time evolved state where I decompose into eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. I can take any Hamiltonian, uh, take its eigenvectors, and write any quantum state as a linear combination of it. And when we time evolve, evolve we kind of just evolve a phase factor. And of course, phase estimation relies on the fact that we can kind of project onto these phase factors with quantum Fourier transform. But now we go one step beyond and not just look, into, look at how how the state vector coefficients evolve in time, but rather if we look at how observable measurements uh, evolve in time. In fact, observable properties uh, of a quantum state evolve according to this equation. And so it's look, it looks a bit complicated, but basically I just take this equation here and plug it in from both the left and right. And because of that, uh, I will have some prefactors. I'll discuss that later. It's not very important now. The important bit is that uh, we will have frequencies in the observable measurement that precisely correspond to gaps in the Hamiltonian, uh, any possible pair, uh, energy pairs in the Hamiltonian. And of course, we have this prefactor here. Uh, the take home message is that uh, it can be arbitrarily small, it can be exponentially small, then this approach is useless. But the point is that in practice, we can actually, uh, in many instances, we can prepare states where we have a reasonable overlap uh, with the low-lying eigenstates. And in that case, this uh, intensity or prefactor is quite reasonable, actually. But then still we have a dependence on the observable. So the important bit is that the frequency doesn't depend at all on the observable. 
it's completely independent, but still the, the intensity might depend on that. But this is why shadows are extremely useful, because with shadows we have we gain information about a lot of different properties, observable properties of a quantum state, and we can exploit that. So ultimately, uh, the, the approach boils down to basically this uh, little schematic. That we, let's imagine that we simulate the time evolution of some molecule and kind of observe these uh, classical shadows, which are illustrated here as like the shadows that the molecule casts. And from those shadows, we can actually reconstruct classically many, many different observable properties of the quantum state as time-dependent signals. Because of this equation, we know that every observable measurement has to oscillate in time precisely at the frequencies of the gaps. We basically want to correlate the different uh, uh, time-dependent signals so that we can filter out only the common frequencies across each and every observable property. And there is, uh, there is a certain classical post-processing step for that. I'll, I'll discuss that in a bit. But ultimately, the aim is to extract a, a spectrum, which is kind of the Fourier transform of the common signal across every observable property. And that spectrum is really similar to what we know about from standard spectroscopic methods like NMR spectroscopy or IR spectroscopy. It tells us uh, a lot of information about uh, the system, not just energy gaps, but the intensities also contain some information. Okay, so how do we do that? Um, so first of all, we similarly just to phase estimation, we evolve, at, uh, evolve the quantum state at different time steps. And we stop there, and we do a randomized measurement, set of measurements on that time evolved quantum state. And from that, we estimate a large number of properties with classical shadows. And so in this particular work, we focused on the simplest possible case when the observables are a local poly strings. Uh, the reason is that uh, they give us the most elegant uh, error bounds, and, and they, they work extremely well with NISC error machines. And kind of we assume in this work that we only look at at most three local observables. They actually contain more than enough information for, for our purposes. And so if we write it formally, essentially we want to estimate entries of a matrix like this, where every entry in the matrix corresponds to an evolution at a certain time step, and every uh, column, every entry in a column corresponds to, to one observable. And we can actually take the proofs from, from, from this paper, which uh, Richard Kuhn just talked about, and if we plug these things in, then we come up with the, the sample complexity of, of estimating this matrix up to some shock noise. And the scaling is linear, obviously, in the number of time steps, because we perform different um, uh, randomized measurements at every time step. We have, unfortunately, an exponential dependence on the locality of the Pauli operator, but that's actually fine because we, it turns out we need only care about local Pauli observables and uh, that contains sufficient information for us. And the really nice thing with shadows is that we only have a logarithmic dependence on how many observables we determine. And so it basically means that if I run my quantum computer for a day, I can determine a thousand properties. But if I run my quantum computer for, let's say, two days, I can now determine a million properties uh, and a much larger matrix. And this is now just an illustration how, how things work. And uh, it shows the data matrix. I have 200 time steps and around 10,000 observables because it's a 14-qubit system. And you would expect oscillating things, right? It doesn't really look oscillating. Uh, the thing is that I'm only using 100 shots uh, to produce this plot, and that's very, very low. That means I have a lot of shot noise on my, on my uh, estimates. So it kind of looks just random noise. It looks actually useless. But the whole point is, of this procedure is that it's, it's not a square matrix. I have a lot more information about how, many diff how the different observables evolve. And in fact, we can go up to extremely large matrices, like 10 to the 8 in, in, in this uh, row size. And the nice thing is that we, we take this matrix and do some non-trivial uh, classical post-processing and actually calculate this really small uh, fixed-size square matrix. I don't know if you can see, but it 
it looks um, periodic, right? So there is some periodic structure in it. And that actually contains uh, the gap information. We just need to extract the fre frequencies. And uh, first of all, what I'm doing here is very, very similar to principal component analysis. I'm just taking my data matrix, calculating this D-transpose D object, which is a square matrix now. And it's, it's a correlation matrix. But it's not really a principal component analysis. So in, in, um, in signal processing, they actually call it a subspace method because the dominant eigenvectors of this square matrix uh, actually contain information about the signals, common signals, uh, across the columns of the matrix. And the nice thing is that it's a matrix-matrix multiplication, but it's not a square matrix. So in fact, we can actually do this in linear time. And uh, we, with a very simple experiment, we can work out uh, how fast we can actually calculate this post-processing step. And it turns out with 10 to the 8 observables, we can get away with le less than an hour computation with just a single uh, uh, desktop PC. And the nice thing is that it's fully parallelizable. So in principle, we can have multiple nodes and go beyond even by a few orders of magnitude. And that, that gives us a lot of information about these frequencies from which we can extract the Fourier spectrum. And that's how it looks. So it shows that I was using 100 uh, shots but I can actually even get away with 10 shots. That's, that's really nice. Only 10 shots per, per time step. That, that's a, human, a huge amount of shot noise, but the important bit is that we have a lot of information and we only care about like, common frequencies across each and every signal. Uh, another nice thing is that it's Heisenberg limited naturally, because um, Heisenberg limited means that if we evolve for longer time, then we get proportionally more precise estimates, um, widths of these peaks. And obviously the peaks here correspond to the gaps. And another nice thing is that we, we actually have control, we have a quantum computer, we have control over what kind of initial state we put in. And here I'm choosing an initial state that has a dominant overlap with the ground state and only little overlap with the excited states. And so I can suppress unwanted uh, peaks. Uh, and of course, uh, the whole point of using classical shadows is that we can boost the signal to noise ratio just by employing more and more observables. Um, but the really cool thing about shadow spectroscopy is that it's, it's kind of immune to noise, uh, gate noise. And uh, this shows uh, a numerical simulation. It shows that psi here is now the level of error in a circuit. I will later define psi, but basically 1.0 is already a really strong error rate. And it shows that if I increase the error rate, then it makes, of course, the peaks disappear in shot noise because gate noise destroys the information. But the important thing is that the center of the peak is exactly where it should be with, with an ideal quantum computer. So kind of as long as the um, gate noise is not brutal, so this peak hasn't yet uh, disappeared in shot noise, then I can kind of pretend that I have a perfect quantum computer and kind of extract perfect uh, gap information. Uh, the reason for that is it's actually not that difficult to understand. So if we make some assumptions about, about the noise model, so here I'm assuming that um, we have this kind of noise model. I don't want to go into the details. Uh, it translates to the fact that I assume that every quantum, the, the quantum channel of every gate is such that with some probability, it implements the ideal operation, and with a small probability, it implements some error event. So typically, dephasing, depolarizing uh, noise channels are such, such like that. And there is some prefactor. Uh, there is a really simple proof to this theorem that says that the noisy signal exactly decomposes into the ideal signal plus an artifact, the red one. And so, we can actually prove some, some bounds about the artifact, and the artifact doesn't really have any structure. And because of that, we kind of recover the ideal signal, except up to a scaling factor, it, uh, uh, it gets smaller. And so here I now define Xi. So it's actually kind of the number of gates times the per gate, per gate error rate. And of course, we have, unfortunately, an exponential uh, decrease in the signal intensity as a function of this, but that's kind of expected. The really important message here, I think, is that in VQE, we develop all of these error mitigation techniques to try to extract 
the energy of a quantum state, uh, and we want to correct for the, uh, for the effect of errors on the expected value measurement. Rather, here we just encode the information into frequencies, and then we are almost immune to uh, typical gate errors. I, I should note here that this is obviously an idealization, but in practice we can do twirling operations to convert uh, typical error channels into this form. And just a bit about applications. So this is obviously super NISC friendly because what we need is just time evolution plus very, very simple randomized measurements. And this simulation shows that we can even get away with starting kind of uh, a VQE optimization where we decrease the energy. But uh, the problem with VQE is that we might get trapped in local optima. And that's actually fine in this case, because we start from a state where we have a good overlap with the ground state, uh, and still we have some overlap with the first excited state, so we are not converged at all. But we, that's actually what we want, because then we have overlap with the desired eigenstates, and then we can do a time evolution uh, with a standard VQE circuit. And the nice thing about that is these VQE time evolution algorithms uh, are actually constant depth because we just update the parameters of the circuit such that it uh, tracks the evolution of the quantum state. So the overall time uh, that we can evolve for is independent, or the circuit depth is independent of the overall time. But of course, VQE is plagued with these huge repetition numbers, and still we might need um, extremely large circuit repetition numbers. Uh, but it does not affect shadow spectroscopy. We still just need a few dozen or maybe a hundred shots per time step. And another cool feature is now I'm showing you applications that assume here that we have a fault, early fault-tolerant quantum machine, which means that um, we already have error correction, but the uh, logical error rates are not that great. So we are kind of still limited in the circuit depth. But this already allows us to, for example, do trotterization with some really crude approximations. And the simulation shows that <clears throat> We are taking extremely crude trotterizations uh, with trotter steps of 0.5. Uh, this results in huge algorithmic errors. And you can see that here is the ideal peak that we should recover. This is the ideal um, gap energy information. Because of the massive algorithmic errors, simulation errors, our peak is significantly off. But still, it's nice because we, we have a very well defined, nice peak which means that we still have a nice frequency, is just very off. Uh, so, <laughs> right? <laughs> we can actually work with that. So what happens if I decrease um, uh, the trotter time step, so I get closer a little bit to the exact simulation? Then you can see the peak starts to migrate. Then I start to decrease dt even further. And we start migrating closer and closer to the ideal one, but as you can see, we are still far away. And it turns out, if you just work out the numbers, how many trotter steps we need, we need an extremely large and extremely deep circuit to get a good enough trotter evolution. But actually, that's fine in this context, because we can just plot the peak centers as a function of dt, and then extrapolate back to dt goes to zero. And that actually allows for, for a really precise, uh, surprisingly precise uh, estimation of the, of the gap. And actually, Nathan Wiebe has a, a paper on, on this in the context of phase estimation and using Chebyshev polynomials for, for doing this extrapolation. So, so one can even prove that uh, it actually gives exponential improvements. Uh, we even think that this will be super useful for fully fault-tolerant quantum computers, where, of course, we can do uh, standard phase estimation. Uh, uh, but there is some reason why we should, we can actually use uh, this approach instead of phase estimation. In fact, it's kind of, it gives us similar information to phase estimation, but we no longer need uh, these complicated uh, ancillary registers. But in a fully photoreant machine, it doesn't really matter. However, here we have a lot of classical information about the quantum state and about the time evolution. And we can actually use that to extract really useful information about our system. So for example, here it shows a chemical system and, and the corresponding spectra. And one important bit is that, of course, we have multiple peaks, which correspond to all these kinds of uh, different excitation energies. This is what chemists are primarily interested. But since we reconstruct lots of observables, 
we can actually cluster the different observables uh, asking the question, does this observable correspond to this peak or whether to this peak? We can correlate the corresponding signals. And it will tell us that this excitation corresponds to Pauli X1, X2 operator. So it must be an electron going from this atom to this atom. And chemists really like these kinds of things and, and it's super useful information. Uh, and of course, here it shows an application where we can determine uh, these potential energy surfaces. And do I have another minute? Uh, just, okay, so just quickly to conclude. Uh, thanks for my co-authors. So two of them are here, Richard and, and Matt. They will present posters. Do check them out if you're interested or if you have any questions. Um, another thing, if I still haven't convinced you that classical shadows are interesting and uh, useful in practice, uh, here is another uh, super useful application whereby we use classical shadows to, to significantly speed up training, like we observed uh, an increase of five orders of magnitude in practice, and we use we did determine covariances with these shadows, and, and Greg is actually here, he's presenting a poster on that, and also an advertisement of our in-house uh, quantum simulator, it's one of the fastest ones, and Chicha is presenting a poster on, on this one. And thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, thank you very much for the really interesting talk. Um, just to go back to the, the comment on the, the robustness to noise, uh, could you maybe make a comment on, are there forms of the noise model that might break that assumption, like for example, coherent noise and crosstalk, and things like that? Of course, that? yeah, uh, coherent noise is a very typical example, like uh, crosstalk. Amplitude damping channel is one that's not of this form. But typically, I think experimentalists aim to apply twirling so that they convert, for example, crosstalk into, into this kind of error, uh, probabilistically. So obviously the assumptions break under those kinds of noise sources. Uh, but I think generally the field is hopeful that we need only treat these kinds of noise sources because it's a pretty good approximation. Thank you so much. Uh, excellent talk and very exciting. New, new stuff. Uh, I've never been, haven't seen this stuff before. It's, it's funny. It's an answer to my question about <laughs> what can you use shadows for. And I was getting. I thought that there was no use. To now you've shown us a whole talk on it. Um, uh, so the caveats. Let's do the. Let's do the the ugly of this of your uh, approach. So you need um, you need a good initial state that has overlap with. That's right. The, yeah. the eigenvalues, the eigenvectors that you're interested in. Exactly. You need um, you need to know you need Pauli's that have overlap with, uh, yeah, with kind, the kind of, um, So it's easy for us to determine each and every local three local Pauli string. So kind of what we need is um, that the information is contained uh, in local Pauli operators. And so actually, I forgot to mention that in. Quantum chemistry, it, I think, says somewhere, yes, it's the sweet spot. <laughs> the reason for that is in quantum chemistry, in the so-called jordan Wigner encoding, we know that actually the information is exponentially contained in local observables, meaning that um, two locals are the most intensive, and if you go to three local, four local, the intensity drops exponentially. And we also know that in... Um, so in or uh, jordan Wigner. so we worked this out in jordan Wigner. Uh, which is surprising, of course. I guess that's why you are looking like that. <laughs> because, um, you know, in Jordan Wigner, the, the, the Hamiltonian is given in terms of these non-local, actually totally global operators. And that's why shadows are not really useful uh, for quantum chemistry or the standard cheap form of shadows. But the interesting bit is here that we don't measure the Hamiltonian. We rather want to measure excitation operators in some sense. And the excitation operators are, in the Jordan Wigner, kind of lo almost local. Uh, because if you think about in Jordan Wigner, you encode one qubit as an orbital. If you have an excitation, then you can think about that roughly as uh, putting one electron from one orbital to the other, very roughly speaking. Um, and actually, in, in translation invariant spin problems, 
uh, there are some papers that show that uh, you similarly have an exponential localization of these excitation operators. What I'm telling you is only true for, for low-lying eigenstates. It's, it's not generally true for higher excited states. Yes, that was my last question. So the, um, uh, yeah. Oh, up above? Yeah, thank you for the talk. I was just curious in the following case, how would you do a rigorous quantum resource estimate for a non-trivial, trivial, non-simulatable case? Um, of, say, 50 so, qubits. So the problem is we, at this point, we have no idea what these will be. Indeed. Just know that in practice, in many cases, we can get away with uh, quite reasonable intensities. But it, it, in no way it is uh, true in general. So you can, it's very easy to contra construct counterexamples. Thanks. So I think we can ask the speaker more questions during the upcoming coffee break, but let's thank him again.